Awesome. Um, like I said just now, I just want to thank everybody. It's a small crowd, but we really appreciate appreciate having you here for our donations and transfer agreements panel. My name is Tanya Calvin. I also go by T. Um, I use they them pronouns and I'm the community engagement archivist for the Black Metropolis Research Consortium. Um, just to give a quick visual description before introducing the BMRC, I'm a light-skinned Black person with short Black curly hair. I'm wearing headphones and some clear rimmed glasses, um, a blue sweater, and there's a yellow wall with a white door behind me. Um, if you don't know about the BMRC already, we are a Chicago-based membership association of libraries, universities, museums, community and arts organizations, and other archival institutions. Our mission is to connect everybody who seeks to document, share, understand, and preserve Black experiences. And our vision is to be essential to promoting the discovery, preservation, and use of Black historical collections. We really appreciate you having you all here today. We're going to take questions in the chat and we're going to stop for questions after each panelist's presentation. Um, and we'll have about eight to 10 minutes for questions after each presentation. Um, I'll also be sharing quickly right now a link to a resource packet that has PDF files of documents from each panelist's repository um, about related to their donations and transfer agreements processes. So there's deed of gifts in there, um, lists of what folks do and do not accept and things like that. Um, so without getting too much more into it, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our first panelist. Lee Terulo is the Director of Collections at Oak Park Public Library. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with Lee's presentation. And we can get started. Oh, Lee, you're muted. Oh, sorry about that. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for allowing me to come um, and talk about special collections at the Oak Park Public Library. Um, a quick description of myself. I'm a light skinned black woman with long braids um, and I'm in front of a beige wall. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the Oak Park Public Library, our special collections department. Um, some of the collections that we have, kind of um, future projects and aspirations, um, and give you a little bit of information about that. So we can start. So the Oak Park Public Library um, in Oak Park, Illinois. Um, the public library was founded in 1903. Um, and just to share a little bit about our vision, mission, and community aspirations, um, we feel, um, you know, it's our duty um, to empower every voice in our community, and our community is not just Oak Park. We recognize that we are part of a larger Chicago area. Um, of course, as a public library, we share the information services and opportunities that fulfill uh, Oak Park's aspirations, the aspirations of the larger community. Um, and some of those uh, literacy, education, diversity, inclusion, equity, empathy um, are really important to the organization and how we set up our programs and collections. Okay. Um, so our values and commitments, um, this has been a growing area for us as an organization. Um, we are an anti-racism organization, um, and we follow a lot of philosophies and policies that kind of guide our everyday work. Um, of course, the Urban Library Council's race and social equity statement. Um, we have our own equity and anti-racism statement um, and our own anti-racism strategic plan. Um, and basically what that does is we incorporate that in everything we do from programming to physical access of the building to employment um, and our collections. Um, you can take a look at our collection strategy statement um, and of course our confidentiality of circulation records policy. Um, but we follow a lot uh, the uh, American Library Associations, of course, the Library Bill of Rights, Freedom to Read and et cetera. 
Um, so special collections at the Oak Park Public Library, um, kind of where you don't really see medium sized public libraries um, have the size of collection that we do. Um, founded right alongside um, the founding of the public library. So early on, staff recognized that we needed to be collecting materials that reflected our community. Um, and kind of out of that, of course, historic collections that reflect Oak Park, the history of the library, um, artifacts and ephemera, of course, relating to what we call the big two in Oak Park, Frank Lloyd Wright and Ernest Hemingway. Um, but we have a lot of other things on our collection and we recognize that we serve a diverse community and our special collections needs to reflect that diversity. Okay. Um, and so the last couple of years with the pandemic, um, we in special collections kind of sat down and really thought about where we've been and where we're going. Um, historically, we've been a donation based collection as a public library, people drop off historic items, things that they think reflect the history of our community. And that's kind of how we've grown the collection over the years. Um, we recognize that while that is a foundation of our collection, we also need to make an effort to go out and acquire collections. Um, we can't just sit back and wait for people to donate material. We need to actively go out in our community and find those collections that are meaningful to tell uh, the history and the events of our community. Um, we really pride ourselves in providing a space for more diverse and inclusive collections. Um, and going forward, our focus is really going to be on community archives. Um, so we recognized during the last two years with the pandemic, the murder of George Floyd, um, the Black Lives Matter movement, we can't just wait for history to happen and then go back and actually collect those items that reflect those events. We need to be actively collecting materials as things happen in our community. Um, so we have really sat down and really thought, how can we do that? Of course, being a member of BMRC um, and other organizations, really reaching out there to potential donors, letting them know what we're doing, and then kind of explaining the process for donating materials to our archives. Um, we have a lot of unique partnerships um, with donors and local organizations. Um, of course, the BMRC, Chicago Collections, um, we work very closely with a lot of non-for-profit organizations in our community, um, like the foundation of Ernest Hemingway of Oak Park. Um, and actually, uh, that's a really good blueprint for how we work with organizations. Um, the Hemingway Archive uh, is under our purview. We uh, provide reference access to it, uh, collections care, but we do not own that collection. That collection is owned by another organization um, that we've provided space and um, staff, uh, and we program and actively take care of those collections. Go back just one more. Oh, yeah, I think we, I think we, we yeah, bumped ahead a little bit. Um, so this is the Hemingway Archives. So when the library, this current building was built, we knew we wanted to provide physical access to a historic collection. Um, and the foundation of Oak Park, um, Ernest Hemingway Foundation, the library has worked with for a very long time. Um, so like I said, this is a partnership. This is uh, we do not own the collection. We do not own copyright of the collection. We provide physical access. We program. We digitize. We make it available to the public. Um, and we've kind of used this as a blueprint going forward for how we at work with other organizations who perhaps may not want to donate their collection outright, um, but we are happy to provide a physical space and expertise for doing that. Um, some upcoming projects and aspirations. Uh, this is an image of Dr. Percy Julian. Uh, Dr. Julian lived in Oak Park, was one of the first African-American families uh, to purchase real estate in Oak Park. Um, 
he is the missing piece in Oak Park. Um, along with Ernest Hemingway and Frank Lloyd Wright, Dr. Julian really doesn't have a presence in Oak Park, um, something that his daughter Faith Julian has mentioned quite a bit. Um, so we in Special Collections recognize that this is an oversight. Um, he needs to be reflected in our collections um, and we're gonna be focusing on that going forward. Um, but we recognize that there are a lot of other people, organizations who are not reflected um, in collections in Oak Park. So that's, that's really our aspiration for the next couple of years. How do we diversify those collections? How do we build those collaborations and partnerships? Um, the library is very fortunate um, that Special Collections is its own department. Um, we have our own budget line. We have a lot of talented staff. Um, so we can really devote ourselves full time uh, to these collections. So how do you start a conversation um, with the Oak Park Public Library? Give us a call, email, stop by. Um, we like to have conversations, show you the physical space. Uh, can't come to us, we'll come to you. Um, we will discuss the physical and digital access to the potential collection and our collaborations. Um, you know, a, a note, this is the pandemic and while the public library has finally opened up full hours, full access, um, because of the mask mandate, our special collections reading room is closed. Um, so we've had to be um, a lot more flexible in that if we can't get you into the physical space to have that conversation, we're happy to do a Google Hangout, a Zoom. If you're comfortable, we can drive out and see you, have a conversation about what you have and kind of your vision um, for your materials and how they should be accessed. Um, we'll discuss the collaborations with organizations that we partner with. Um, you know, ideas on digitization, providing physical access to the collection. We're happy to talk about all of it, um, answer any questions you may have. We have a deed of gift form, um, but we're more than happy to have those conversations before we even get, um, you know, ink on paper. So we want people to be comfortable, even if you're not interested in donating materials to the library, we're certainly interested in talking to anyone um, and have a conversation. Maybe we can do a joint program. Maybe we can do something to highlight the collection that you have. We're really here to be, um, give, you, give you voice, give you space to talk about your collections. Um, and we're really excited to speak with you. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Lee. That was wonderful. It's exciting to hear about um, the future of y'all's collecting at OPPL. Um, it's thrilling to hear about proactive archiving. That's something that I know a lot of other BMRC members are also interested in. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat right now, but this is the time to ask them to Lee if you're interested in collections. Um, oh, Allison has a question. Are you able to put on exhibits? Yes, um, so we are fortunate. We have an art gallery um, right in front of special collections. We have space for exhibits. Um, we can do physical exhibits. We can do um, poster board with digitized images. Um, kind of anything you want. We've got a fantastic communications department who is incredibly talented and has uh, created some amazing things. So yes, we do exhibits. Awesome. I'm curious, um, I have a question about uh, what you were saying about um, the Hemingway Archives Partnership being um, a collaboration that's sort of a model now. And I've been, I was just wondering if you've had any other similar collaborations besides the Hemingway Archives that have been similar, or if you've um, sort of talked about that with community members or other organizations that might be interested in a similar setup. Um, yes, actually, um, an, our newest partnership is with Momenta, which is a dance company in Oak Park. Um, they have a huge collection um, of materials, 
um, you know, not just costumes, but but playbills and, and things of that nature. And so we are uh, providing physical access to um, some of their audiovisual materials. Um, Oak Park had one of the first um, climate controlled spaces in Oak Park. Um, so we have had a lot of organizations who have reached out, even just for physical space. Um, we have a collection of correspondence between Frank Lloyd Wright and the um, Unity Temple congregation that we hold. We also do not own that collection, but we provide access. Um, Unity Temple Restoration Foundation, the first restoration in the 70s, we hold a lot of those materials that were used um, to refurbish Unity Temple. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a model. Um, I think we recognize because of um, kind of limited physical space, it made more sense to collect um, things and create partnerships with other organizations, um, not just build our own collections. Um, so yeah, that that just that's kind of a, a theme we ran with um, the mm. history of special collections. That's great. It's really great to hear that more repositories are expanding their options for partnerships like that, because I know a lot of other folks that I've spoken with through my engagement work that um, have sort of hesitancies around um, a lot of donations policies at some repositories. And I think it's great that there's a level of transparency and relationship building um, that you're able to hold those partnerships. It's really wonderful. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. I'll give it about 30 more seconds to see if anybody wants to speak up. Um, but in the meantime, I'll stop sharing my screen. I will turn back on my camera. Awesome. Well, if there's no more questions for Lee, we can move on to the next panelist, if that's all right with everybody. Um, Dina Robinson is the founder of Shorefront Legacy Center. Um, I am excited about Shorefront's work and want to introduce it, but I'm sure Dina will do a great job of speaking about that. So I will just hand it off to him. Thank you, Tanya. Um, again, my name is Dino Robinson. I'm a middle-aged African-American male, uh, medium complexion um, with uh, locks uh, that are about shoulder length and a salt and pepper full beard and mustache, which I vowed not to dye. So um, and I have a uh, blurred out background. So you don't see my messy office at this point because I'm in the middle of moving a lot of boxes right now. Um, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Um, I am the founder of Shorefront, as mentioned before. We are a community-based archive based in Evanston, Illinois. And uh, we service a community or the suburban areas, um, Evanston North Lake Forest, um, with very specific interest in Evanston, Glencoe, and Lake Forest because of its long-term um, African-American communities in the North Shore spanning over 150 years. Uh, we are in communication with and have built relationships with multi-generational African-American families and organizations that have been around for multiple decades. Um, this uh, short front started out as a personal interest of mine, but grew to um, hold over 450 linear feet of archival holdings, uh, consists of video, audio, and tangible items, um, and documents, and photographs, and negatives. Um, and, and we're starting to get scrapbooks now, too, which is really quite exciting. Uh, we manage five websites uh, with our view on accessibility. And we also produce publications through uh, Shorefront Press. And in our, our main mission with uh, Shorefront is to collect, preserve, and educate people about Black history on Chicago's suburban North Shore. Um, the archive started in my home. Actually, the room I'm sitting in is where it started. Uh, we did eventually move to a renovated, repurposed school building where we started growing our collection. And now we're in a lower level of a historic African-American church, uh, Sherman United Methodist Church, uh, who is surprising their mission is very similar to ours, uh, especially around education and preservation. 
and we thought our admissions aligned and they had space, uh, over 1700 square feet of space that they were not using. And they offered it to Shorefront for use, for storage. So we're in a lower level, but it's a dry building. Uh, the climate there is relatively consistent. And we're in, you know, I guess what we consider in Evanston high ground. So there's never been any water issues there. Um, previous to us occupying the space was a space for a daycare that was housed there for about 40 years. Um, so in this space, we do have some small exhibits, but we primarily focus on collecting. And especially up, you know, in the last 10 years, our collections have grown tenfold. Um, where when we moved into this building, we had about the equivalent of about six or seven uh, bookshelves. Now we have over 25. Um, so we're active collectors. We're actively uh, engaging the community in acquiring artifacts that represent the historic contributions of the local African-American community. And many of these things have been, you know, not seen by the community before. We often talk about it. We, 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 we think about it. We bring it up in meetings uh, and in community engagement, especially when there's something controversial that's happening. Maybe a building's being torn down or a house of a well-known family is vacated and all the artifacts are gonna to be tossed. What's gonna be done with that? And Shorefront kind of developed itself in 1995 as a place to become a repository, to answer two things. One, to build an archive of the African American experience, but also to address the situations that the local historical organizations did not necessarily deem this as important information to hold. So, Shorefront took up that banner and decided to do this ourselves. It is community driven, it is all volunteer ran, and um, we have an active um, three tiered board structure a board of directors, board of advisors, and an honorary board. The board of directors are the uh, controllers of the organization, they are the hands on, the policy setters, and fundraisers, and oftentimes volunteers. The honor of um, the advisory board or it's just that they advise on what we need to do, providing scholarly context, legal advice, and guidance for what we need to do in preservation of our archives. And then honorary board, um, which we utilize their expertise in community engagement. It's their friends, their own family members that are donating to this archives. And those relationships were strong connections to uh, convincing families that something needs to be done with their archives, whether it be Shorefront, whether it's a local university or any other repository in the Chicago metropolitan area that meets the needs uh, for their desires. Or what we strongly advocate for too is that, you know, family take care of their own archives and here are some simple steps to do so. But if it comes to that time where families do want to or organizations do want to donate to Shorefront, uh, we kind of go through uh, several things here. Um, first, we always have available a list of items that we're always looking for. So that's one of the number one things people ask for. What are you looking for? And a lot of times when I speak in the community about archiving, uh, some families think immediately valuable items like, you know, a gold watch collection or, you know, the valuable painting hanging on the wall. And we're, we're like, no, we don't want those things. So yeah, they're great, but that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for things that illustrate your life, your family life, uh, organizations you're involved in, uh, businesses, uh, things that capture the slice of life over a period of time in this community, in this area. And they can include all kinds of things you may not think about. And a lot of times these things end up in garbage, um, especially when somebody passes. Uh, so we want to keep constantly remind families and organizations, these are the things that we're actually looking for that actually explain things for future use. And I can't say a number of times where people ask about an old organization and we actually have nothing about them except for maybe one group photograph because at the time, the, the organization's historian, you know, all the documents live with them and, when, and it died with them and the um, items with them were destroyed afterwards. So we have this list available for people to um, you know, think about. Um, sometimes in the first steps, sometimes there are only like a few items that people will donate. 
And so we have this like what I call like the, the, the general acquisition form where we kind of give a brief description of why we want these, um, how it will be stored, who will own, um, and we kind of do an inventory list of what is being donated. And we do have a small section there about uh, the permanent, is this a permanent donation or a temporary donation? And we have that there, so we kind of emphasize, you know, family ownership. And the temporary ownership tends to circle around things that we're going to end up digitizing. So if they're handing over a scrapbook, but they want that scrapbook back, but they want to preserve it in some way, they'll put it in our possession to digitize that. And then once we're done digitizing, we hand back over the original documents, along with a copy of the digitized files that we've done. But the grant us permission to utilize that as long as it fits within our mission. Uh, and we also have other items, uh, sometimes attached letters or addendums that families may have. Uh, we try and put the controls in the family's hands as much as possible. How can we use these? Um, what are the rights? But we do um, always say that, you know, you're not going to get paid for, you know, us producing things. And we have to make sure that's very clear. Um, it's also clear that we don't buy archives. We either donate it or are lent for digitizing. However, there's instances where we have more of a, com a collaborative engagement. And this kind of falls in lines with a lot of organizations, larger organizations. And with that, we end up doing more of a memorandum of understanding. It clearly outlines um, the roles and responsibilities of both Shorefront and a donor organization. So there's a clear and concise plan of action. And these um, end up becoming relationships where on an annual basis, uh, an organization would have a budgetary line that supports financially Shorefront's upkeep of the archives that they're submitting to Shorefront for its upkeep. Um, and this is an actual one, I just stripped out the organizational name, but this is one that we did do recently with one organization in the North Shore area. And we kind of like, you know, try and do some things to um, help clarify and help people understand um, the efforts that goes into archiving. Uh, for the sake of financial assessment, we do assign a value, a monetary value, but it'll take to initially process this. But we also make it clear that this is not what we're asking you to pay. We just want you to know what this is so that they can take that back to their group and determine what kind of annual support they may want to offer Shorefront on an annual basis or on a monthly basis. Uh, we also have other stipulations in there that might be on Shorefront side or by the organizational side, side so that there's a clear understanding of those responsibilities. And we tend to review this on an annual basis as well with a short update letter from Shorefront. Here's what we did this year. And the organization itself would donate additional items as, on an annual basis that captures like things like their agendas, minutes, and new photography that needs to go into the archive. Um, and, you know, in wrapping up, you know, our goal is to take, you know, things like this. I'm sure many of you, um, this was mentioned earlier with Mr. Rulo, about going to a location, looking at things. Sometimes you come into this type of situation where it's a lot of stuff and the family didn't know what to do. And this is actually a family that we were engaged with for 10 years to try and capture this family's archives. But because of emotional attachments, they didn't want to let go of it yet, but it still was stored in a house that was unoccupied for 10 years. It's been ransacked twice. But so when it came time when everything had to be discarded, they called me in at the last minute. I had three hours to go through the house and capture as much as I can. Fortunately, I knew enough about the family, knew what to look for, expressed what we're looking for. And what, when I was actually demonstrating that, family members started helping immediately and said, oh, here's more stuff. Here's these documents. Here's the things you're looking for. Grab them, put them in my car with any materials I could find. We bring them back to Shorefront. We do an initial processing, putting them in um, standardized boxes for storage and later processing to get an idea of what's needed, to check for infestation, for water damage, uh, other things that might be an issue with care and upkeep of the, um, the collection. Then we start further organizing it, trying to identify what type of archival boxes that are needed. And finally, when we get them all organized and stacked and and, and processed in our couple boxes with finding aids. Um, but what we found with this is that when families see this and they're able to see this, and a lot of times we bring them into the process to, here's what we're doing, here's our status, 
here's where we're going. And in doing so, we're building that relationship with families and with the community that in itself um, has a domino effect where they're telling their other friends and families that this is where you should go. And so it wasn't unusual for us, especially during this pandemic, that in the last two years, we probably acquired, I would say, those bike baker's boxes you saw on the floor there in the previous picture. We probably acquired 75 plus more boxes like that of archival materials for the last few years. But in doing this, we are building that relationship and families and we're engaging the families with this. Um, and, and, and they keep coming back with new information, filling in the blanks and new connections with the uh, community as a whole. So with that, we make these um, items available to the public for research use. Uh, they've been used in publications, documentary films. Um, we are strongly um, you know, emphasize citation of its use, uh, especially right now, um, Evanston is in the middle of doing a reparations program and much of Shorefront's archives are being utilized in documentary films and reporting and, uh, and, and advisory purposes as well. And that's where we found where archives can play a vital part in how it helps inform and educates a broader community. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gino. I always get really excited hearing about um, the sort of longevity of the work that Shorefront has done in building those relationships. Um, we had Dino speak on a panel last November, actually, about community engagement work, and Dino told a lot of really good stories about work um, that he's put into over the years of uh, really engaging community members in truly meaningful ways that they actually trust um, Dino as a person and Shorefront as a repository. So that's great. Um, there's some questions in the chat. So Allison mm -hmm. says, have you seen the OCLC report on the total cost of stewardship that has tools to help gauge the cost of processing a collection? Do you have your own metric for estimating the cost of processing? Well, thank you for um, showing that. Actually, I was not aware of that. So thank you for that. I have to look that up. And two, yes, we did develop our own process. Um, we just kind of gauged on material cost and average cost of like um, hiring a, um, an archivist to process a collection. And so we utilized that metric based on square footage and hours based on that to kind of give an idea of how much it would cost to process a given collection. So we can go by one box by box, size by size folders, and overall upkeep of a collection. What it would take to um, maintain it on a yearly basis. Sometimes if it's just another collection of minutes, it constitutes, you know, two inches, you know, of box space. Maybe there's no cost associated with that because we already have a box available for that. Or we have to buy new ones. We kind of just make a, a, a floating record of that. But I would love to see that report and see how that, how they calculate that. Great. Um, and Alan has a question. How do you facilitate public access to the archive? Sure. So Shorefront, because uh, we're a volunteer base, Shorefront open, um, is open to the public on Saturdays from 10 to 2. Uh, but for researchers, um, we have um, call-ins where we can arrange times uh, to come in on weekdays and spend time in the archives. Uh, we've had situations where we had graduate students who are specifically working on a long-term project where we develop uh, a relationship and an arrangement where they have access to the archives with reporting uh, specifically to me uh, what they're working on. So they have like a designated space at Shorefront to work on a very specific um, research project they're working on. Great, thank you for answering those questions. I don't think there are any more. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and transition over to Allison Hinderleiter, who is the Curator of Modern Manuscripts and Archives at the Newberry Library. Um, yeah, Allison, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you, T. Um, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Allison Hinderleiter. I'm the Lloyd Lewis Curator of Modern Manuscripts and Arch Archives at the Newberry Library. I am a middle-aged white woman with dyed purple hair and dark rimmed glasses. And I'm sitting in front of a white wall that has a blueprint and a blue banner behind me. 
I'm going to share my screen now. There we go. And I'm really happy to be presenting this afternoon with um, my fellow BMRC members. Um, these panel discussions are always really enlightening for me, um, both as a presenter and as uh, an attendee. So um, kudos to the BMRC staff and to Tanya, especially for putting these together for us. Um, I have been working at the Newberry Library on and off for the past 30 years, and I started as a student, um, but I've been working in archives at, in, um, for about 20 of those 30 years, and uh, I've been in other institutions in the meantime on various grants and things. Um, so I was going to talk a little bit first about the types of manuscripts and archival collections that we have and we have been collecting historically and then um, talk about some future collecting that we plan to do and um, also go over our deed of gift because I recognize that um, it can possibly be a little bit intimidating to approach an institution and talk about donating your materials if you've never done it before. Um, I do get questions a lot and I'm sure that's why this panel was put together because there are questions about what a deed of gift looks like and, um, and it's great to have the different organizations with their various viewpoints giving you um, sort of variations along the same theme, I think you'll find. So the Newberry has been around as a um, research library in Chicago since 1887. Uh, according to our charter, it is free. It has always been free and always open to the public. Um, we recognize that the building and some of the culture um, around it has, has been intimidating in the past. I've had people say they didn't know if they would be welcome there or here or if they belong here. Um, and that is very unfortunate, um, but I think the, the way that the Newberry has been moving now is that we are positioning ourselves to be a much more welcoming place. And, um, and really, the, everyone has always been able to do research at the Newberry. Um, all you have to do is have a photo ID. Um, you do need to be over 14 to use the collections, but that is the only restriction. Otherwise, you don't need to be from Chicago. You don't need to be affiliated with any university. You don't need to be a student. Um, you just need to have a curious mind and um, wish to use our collections. So we have been um, collecting archival materials since the 19 teens, both by purchase and by donation. Some of our first have been Native American and Indigenous Peoples collections, and also autograph books and photographs of, uh, of Chicagoans. And in the 1940s, we began to work on acquiring uh, literary manuscripts of Chicago literary figures, such as Sherwood Anderson and Ben Hecht and Floyd Dell, um, as well as business archives, um, such as uh, railroad company archives. And we have the archives of the Pullman Railroad Company, the Illinois Central Railroad Company, and the Chicago Burlington and Quincy Railroad Company. Um, a little bit later, we started to focus more on family papers, uh, both Chicago families and immigrant families who uh, came from various locations into Chicago and um, organizational archives, which are you know, clubs and nonprofits, um, basically started doing that in, um, in earnest in the 1970s. And after that, um, our most recent uh, focus has been on dance. Um, we are the, the largest um, repository for Chicago dance uh, companies, dancers, choreographers, uh, dance critics, etc. And I was excited to hear uh, Lee talk about the Momenta archive because we've worked with Stephanie Clemens to get the Doris Humphrey archive at, in, at the Newberry. And uh, I'm very pleased that Momenta is over at Oak Park um, being very well preserved over there. Um, some other focuses in our collection, just really briefly, uh, other performing arts such as theater and music. We have a large Civil War 
collection. Um, we uh, have a lot of papers of journalists and reporters, columnists and editorial cartoonists. Um, we have a very large map collection and so maps and travel are a big part. We have travel diaries and scrapbooks, uh, politics, both Chicago and uh, greater Midwest, social action, um, starting from the progressive era in the 1920s and moving uh, all the way to the present day and Black Lives Matter and our um, modern protest collections. Uh, postcards are a big thing since we acquired the Kurt Tyke postcard archive from the Lake County Historical District and um, printing history and book arts, both again in Chicago and worldwide. How to reach us. Um, any way you want, you can come through the door. We're open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to 4. Um, you can also email or call. And um, there is a general email collecting at newberry.org, which is probably easier to remember than hinderlighter A at newberry.org. Either one will work. Um, collecting goes to our uh, catalogers who will then send the um, information off to the correct selector. So it works if you're looking to donate books, um, magazines, or manuscript materials. And I will get the manuscript materials. Uh, posts. Um, the two phone numbers are our main reference phone number and then the one next to my name is my my own phone number and feel free to call me. Um, where do donations come from? So this when Dino showed some of his pictures I was kind of looking at these. Um, again uh, like all of, all of the presenters you've heard from today, we do go out and uh, if the person can't come to us, we come to the person and we come to the collection. Um, I've often heard people be a little bit embarrassed about um, the state of it. There's no need to do that because we've seen everything from extremely organized to extremely disorganized. Um, and so there's uh, no need to clean up before the archivist arrives, I promise. Um, what we do is we take a lot of materials that are in taped up boxes or um, in sort of preservationally unsound boxes and um, rehouse them, preserve them, and um, keep them in a climate uh, controlled storage facility. Um, so we're looking for the long term. We, we want to preserve these for as long as humanly possible. And we also have a digitization department. And so we are able to do digitizing. We don't have a huge budget for it, but um, we do apply to grants all the time and um, receive grants for digitizing materials. Uh, lately, our favorite place to make those digital items uh, accessible is the internet archive because it is accessible to everyone who's got uh, internet connection and it's free to use. And um, so that is, um, that's where we ask people. And again, it's, it's kind of a, a dialogue. If people do donate materials from their family and individuals, they would like to see them digitized. We ask if they would be comfortable having them on the internet archive because not only are they free for everyone to look at, they're free for everyone to download. Um, and we've got to have a conversation about people's comfort level um, and whether, you know, letters, for example, of people who are still living uh, should go up there. Um, and so there's always uh, talks about privacy and confidentiality to uh, talk about. And um, so this is the deed of gift. There is a copy to download in the um, shared folder. So I'll just go through the points. Um, so the very first section is, um, you can see up here, something that differs from Oak Park Public Library and Shorefront Legacy. Um, it is a, an agreement to give, donate, and convey to us. So. Um, we do ask that the material become the physical property of the Newberry Library. We, we don't do deposits and we don't um, have sort of shared uh, ownership just because our space, our stack space is running out. And we realize that if we take on materials that we don't own, 
and we have no more space to accept other materials, you know, then we've potentially said no to some things that we would have said yes to. The um, literary rights and copyrights are not transferred over to the Newberry unless the donor specifies that it is. Uh, if the donor wants to keep copyright and the literary rights of any um, creative works, they are more than welcome to do so. We just need contact information so that when people ask us for uh, the right to reproduce or use something that we can contact that original donor and creator. Um, there are instances where people want to donate materials, but there is personal or private information for people who are still living. And um, we, what we can do is take in those materials, but restrict them for a number of years, be it 25 years, 50 years, 75 years. Um, we cannot do restrictions uh, for people. Uh, I remember an instance where somebody um, at another institution said they didn't want lawyers looking at a collection. Well, there's, there's really no way to police that. So we can't restrict certain people or groups from seeing it, but we can restrict it to, uh, for everyone for a number of years and then open them up after that. And then finally, um, materials that we collect, we don't always take everything. So we uh, give people the option to have us return materials that we do not want. Sometimes they're duplicates or sometimes they're just out of scope for us. Um, or if uh, they don't want to ever see them again, then we would be happy to uh, dispose of them. That includes um, contacting other institutions who might be interested um, or recycling, or if they're books, we can uh, donate them to our annual book fair, which um, generates revenue for the library on the whole. Um, so thank you very much. And this is my contact information again. And I wanna leave you with one awesome picture of a recent collection. We got the Mr. Kelly's collection. Mr. Kelly's was a nightclub, uh, just two blocks from the Newberry that was uh, around from the 1950s to the 1970s. Thank you very much. Thank you, Allison. Um, I also want to note that um, the Newberry has a really great exhibit up that we just saw, Chicago Avant Garde, um, featuring five amazing women who were based in Chicago and did work in Chicago. And um, seeing that work is just one example of how the Newberry uses their materials um, in exhibits and other programming to share with the public. Um, and I appreciate what Allison was saying about the efforts of the Newberry to be more open to the public. As I know, um, there are other repositories around the city that face similar issues with access um, and perceptions of the repository as a sort of door clo um, closed door policies uh, and shifting to an open door um, culture. That's great. Um, I don't think I see any questions, but I will give it a second here before I head off to our last panelist in case anybody has any questions about donating to the Newberry or collections of the Newberry for Allison. Uh, somebody's asking, did you say appointments are not needed for donating? That's correct. Appointments are not needed for donating. Um, you can contact us anytime and I'd be happy to chat with you or meet with you or Zoom with you uh, about donating materials. Great, thank you, Allison. I have a question, if that's all right. Yes, please go ahead. I'm just curious in terms of uh, preserving copyright in the deed, ag deed agreement, um, deed of gift agreement. What what type of license do you do you ask for if you don't ask for a transfer of copyright? Uh, we do not ask for a license. Um, so you can retain the copyright um, for you and your heirs if you like. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Allison?
yes, there is a shared drive. I will link that again in the chat very quickly. Um, and the drive has um, PDF files of different forms um, from each repository related to their donating and transfer agreement policies. No problem. Great. Well, I will finally, at the end, last but not least, hand it off to Elizabeth Locke, who is the archivist of the Vivian G. Harsh Collection at the Chicago Public Library. Um, Beth, off to you. Thanks, Tanya. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Beth Locke, and I am an archivist at Chicago Public Library's Vivian G. Harsh Research Collection of Afro-American History and Literature. Um, I am a white woman with long brown hair, and I'm wearing glasses. Um, I'm currently sitting at a desk in my office. There is a monthly calendar and a neon pink Afrofuturism poster on the wall behind me. Um, and I use she and her pronouns. So right now I'm gonna go ahead and share my PowerPoint presentation with you. All right. Okay, so I'd like to thank the BMRC again for hosting this panel presentation. It's wonderful to learn so much about the other members of the other institutions that belong to the BMRC. All right, so the Harsh Research Collection is housed in Carter G. Woodson Regional Library located at 95th and Halstead in Chicago's Washington Heights neighborhood. It is the largest manuscript collection of African-American history in the Midwest, the second largest in the United States after the New York Public Library's Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Our collection seeks to document the African-American experience in Chicago and the greater Midwest. So here you can see an example of our holdings and the subject areas that the collection covers. So it consists of over 70,000 reference books. Many of them are rare, 500 magazine and journal titles, both current and retrospective, 75 microfilm film uh, research collections, which is over 7,000 microfilm reels and, and growing. Um, and the most unique materials at the Harsh Research Collection are its nearly 250 archival collections documenting the African-American individuals and organizations throughout the Midwest. So our collection policy, the type of materials that we collect, um, is directly tied to the history of the collection's founding. Um, so I want to take just a minute and tell you about how our collection was founded and our namesake, Vivian G. Harsh. In January 1932, the George Cleveland Hall branch of Chicago Public Library opened at 48th Street in Michigan um, in Chicago's Brownsville neighborhood. It was the first full service library started for the diverse and growing black population on the South Side. Ms. Vivian G. Harsh became CPL's first African-American branch head after the, accepting this position at Hall Branch Library. So over time and with really keen insight, Harsh collected rare books, pamphlets, and materials that documented the African-American experience. Um, she noticed it was really lacking in Chicago Public Library, so she decided to grow her own collection Funding for the Special Negro Collection, as it came to be called, um, came from grants and patron donations, and Harsh also used her own money to purchase books for the collection. In the 1930s, the collection's reputation spread and the library became a meeting place for promising young Black writers, artists, and um, activists. They would use Vivian Harsh's Special Negro Collection, and then they would add their own drafts of their manuscripts or their research. So the collection continued to really grow. Vivian Harsh passed away in August 1960. In 1970, her special Negro collection was renamed in her honor and it was moved to the brand new Carter G. Woodson Regional Library in 1975. So um, current Harsh staff are, is really proud to carry on Harsh's legacy in collecting materials that document the African-American experience with a specific emphasis on Illinois and Chicago history. Um, now I'd like to give an overview on the donation process. So what can you expect when you're depositing a collection with Chicago Public Library? So the first step in donating a collection is to contact us. So pick up the phone and give us a call. On the left, I have um, the name of our senior archivist, Beverly Cook, um, and the Harsh Reference Desk and our general email. 
And then on the right is my direct email and office phone number. So please give, um, leave a voicemail if we don't answer and we'll get back to you immediately. That first phone conversation will be a general introduction to the types of materials you're looking to deposit. We'll discuss the history of the collection represents, its current size, location, and set up a time for an archivist to survey the collection in person. So it's the beginning of a much longer conversation about donating and protecting your legacy. Often people are unsure if their materials belong in an archive. Um, that's very common. Uh, don donations can be small, maybe just one scrapbook, or they can be quite large, including hundreds of boxes. So we are seeking rare or one of a kind items um, that document black individuals or organizations. On the left side of the screen, you'll see just a few examples of the types of materials we happily accept. And of course, this is just a short list for examples. Um, and these materials do make up the bulk of our archival holdings. On the right side of the screen is a list of materials we cannot accept. Um, we'll take in newspaper clippings in a collection. If it's a smaller number, maybe just a few folders, but it's a problem if the newspaper clippings are the majority or the entire collection. And basically that's because many newspapers, um, especially the ones that we've seen, are now accessible via online databases such as ProQuest. And also we usually can't digitize newspaper collections because of copyright infringements. So that's one of the reasons that we can't take in really large newspaper clippings collections. Also, we, um, as a manuscript repository, we don't accept oversized artwork or really large bulky items such as furniture. These types of materials are better donated to a museum where they can be really on display and they can have proper conservation. Plaques and awards is another item um, and that is because of size limitations and conservation care. What we will do is we'll come out and we'll photograph your plaques and awards and we'll add those to the collection as images. That way our researchers can still see those items and they can get all the relevant information off of the photographs. And finally, um, we won't take materials that we already have in our collection. <laughs> so usually this pertains to books and serials. Um, to conserve space, we keep just two copies of a published work, sometimes three if the item is really rare. So those are a few things to keep in mind. My job as an archivist basically consists of preserving and promoting collections at the Harsh Research Collection. So preserving includes taking in new collections, processing the collections, and keeping these collections physically safe. Promoting the collections can include having the collections viewed by library patrons in a really a lot of different ways. We showcase our collections with social media posts, creating exhibits and digitization. So at some point during the donation process, we will have a conversation about identifying the legal copyright holder or holders of the materials in a donated collection. So this conversation allows us to determine how we can legally and ethically promote the collection. Um, rights management or copyright determination is a topic that the BMRC could host a whole other panel presentation on. Um, it's a really complicated topic. Um, usually the copyright holder is the creator of the item, although that's not always the case. And when donating a collection, donors can choose to retain or keep the copyright of the materials in their collection, but still choose to give permission for specific types of use to Chicago Public Library. So for example, um, a donor can choose to give permission to digitize their materials for CPL's um, digital collection page. And I have a screenshot of that on the right, so you can see just a couple of the collections that we offer. Once an archivist has physically viewed the collection, we've discussed its rights management and any other issues or concerns that the donor may have, then we're ready for the donation and the signing of the deed of gift. Um, the deed of gift, as you've already heard in today's previous presentations, documents the legal transfer of materials from the donor um, to the library. On the left is our standard deed of gift form. Top right is the text in that document. I've just blown it up so that you can see it a little bit uh, for easier viewing. It acknowledges that the donor is physically giving their materials as an unrestricted gift to Chicago Public Library. 
Then there is a sentence describing the copyrights given to the library as part of the donation process. And this wording can be revised to fit with what the archivist and the donor have already decided. Um, then there's a large section to describe the materials given. And finally, it is signed by the archivist or the li library employee. And of course, we give a copy of the deed of gift to the donors for their records. An addendum can be added to the deed of gift if there's not enough space in any section to describe the collection or to give a more lengthy account of the rights management. Um, actually, our deed of gift form is currently under revision. <laughs> On the bottom right of the screen, you can view two common addendum items we've uh, had recent donors agree to, to help us digitize more collections and share um, images from some of the items in our collections via so social media. So um, basically the deed of gift is a contract between the library and the donor. And we want the donor to be completely comfortable with all aspects before signing. Uh, Chicago Public Library does not require a signed deed of gift before we begin processing or working on the collection, um, but it is the most important part of the donation process before we can really move forward with showing it to the public. It is expected to be a permanent gift to the library. Uh, we do not take collections on loan or with any time constraints on ownership. However, we do a lot of community partnerships. So if you're interested in, in having your collection digitized or on display, then that would be separate than depositing your collection with the Chicago Public Library. Um, so what to expect after your donation? Um, after uh, you have deposited it at the library and it's physically here, an archivist's first step is to inventory the collection. So that could include uh, rehousing materials and addressing any preservation issues discovered, which could be water damage, tears to materials, um, if there's any mold or insect issues with the collection. And that inventory will happen right away um, once the collection is physically in the library. Then the collection will be processed and a finding aid created. This might take some time. It really does depend on the size and of the collection and the type of order that it's in. And we're happy to work with completely unprocessed collections that show up in boxes or garbage bags. Um, as you've heard before, materials come in in all different manners. Um, so a donor may be contacted by the archivist to identify items in the collection, such as photographs, um, or to give context to historical items in the collection. And then if there are multiple identical copies of materials in the collection or items with personal information that maybe shouldn't be in there, then an archivist will contact the donor about returning those items or ask about how they would like them disposed of. And this information can be added to the deed of gift as well. And during this process, donors may view their collections at the library anytime um, once they are donated. Please just reach out to us to let us know when you'd like to come in and we'll make an appointment to sit down and talk with you. Um, the collections will remain closed to the public until they are processed and we have created a finding aid. That's for the security of the documents. But once they're open to the public, there is equal access for everyone. And CPL will promote the collection with um, a news post and will continue to share the collection uh, and do community programs about its history. So here's my contact information. Please reach out. Um, no two donations are exactly alike because new, no two archival donations or collections themselves are exactly alike. Otherwise, what would the point of having an archive with all of these different histories that we'd like to share? So again, just reach out if you have any questions and thanks. Thank you so much, Beth, that's great. Um, Open space for questions. I know I have a question and um, just sort of similar to the question I asked Lee, if you have an example of a community partnership of a digitization or some kind of um, project that you've worked on, just to give an example, an idea of what's possible for um, other organizations out there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've worked with uh, Tim Black's papers and that's one of the collections we have online. Um, if you're not aware, Dr. Black recently passed away in October. He was a resident of Chicago for over 100 years, and his collection is a, re a reflection of that. His work as a civil rights activist, a historian, 
um, his service in World War II in the US Army. Um, and so we really wanted to share his archival collection because so many people asked to view it. Um, it's in great demand. Um, but talking about rights management, Tim Black did not own everything that's in his physical collection, which is over 300 boxes of materials. It's quite the span. Um, he collected a lot of materials that others created. And for his research with publishing his books on um, the oral histories pertaining to Brownsville and Chicago's great migrations. Um, so those were under copyright. So what we did was we went back to Dr. Black and we asked his permission to donate materials he owned the copyright to. And so his digital collection consists of um, his World War II correspondence with his brother and his speeches, which he did own the copyright to. And even just digitizing a portion of that collection, even if it's a small portion, we've seen a, a greater ask to view his physical collection at the library. Because it's a great way to promote his history and really just to get, out, get it out there um, on an online platform. Great, thank you. Sure. Um, we have another question in the chat. Do you accept additional records and items throughout a person's life, even if they donate at a particular point in time? Um, and then there's another question, but uh, I'll let you answer that first one. Sure. So um, I think the question was, do we take multiple donations? Was that it over one person's lifetime? Yeah, it said additional records and items throughout a person's life, even if they donate at a particular point in time. Yeah, absolutely. That's actually very common. Um, somebody will contact us themselves about wanting to donate. Maybe it's a specific book project or maybe it's materials related to an oral history project they did. And then they form a relationship with us. And then as the years pass, they're working on other projects, right? So then we receive more materials. And it's really common for donors to want to hold on to their personal artifacts, but then they're thinking about their legacy. So if something happens to them in the future, then they want to make sure that those materials that they've held on to will reach the library and will be preserved in the same manner. So it's really common. We call them addendums to collections. Great. And then the second question is, what do you turn down in terms of donations beyond the items you listed? Um, that's a good question. Honestly, not that much. The, the items that I listed that we don't accept, and I think I spent more time on that than the materials we do accept, that's pretty much what people have brought to us and we've had to turn away. And it doesn't happen that often. We are really excited to bring in collections and often what people have are the photographs, the manuscript drafts, those one of a kind items that we wanna see here. So the items that I listed pretty much, those are the only items I've ever had to turn down. I can jump in on that too. Um, there, there have been offers that have been super tempting. Um, people have offered to donate their record collection, for example. Um, and it is, you know, a, a personal collection. Someone has spent a lot of time curating commercial recordings, maybe even, you know, recordings, things taped off the radio, things taped live. Um, but we know that we don't have the capacity to to be an audiovisual library. Um, you know, we don't have playback equipment. We don't have a means for people to come and listening. We don't have listening labs. So um, oftentimes when we get material that we know that we can't really handle, um, we do suggest other repositories, you know, um, for a record collection may, or for recordings, maybe the Harold Washington Library Center, which does have listening stations, for example. Yeah, and just to continue off that, um, the BMRC, because we have so many members across the city, are always happy to connect you with anybody at any of the member repositories. There's a list on the BMRC website of everybody who is a member, um, and we often have conversations with folks interested in donations about which repository is the best fit, and even if the repository that you think is the best fit is not um, necessarily a BMRC member, we're so happy to try to figure out a way to facilitate facilitate that connection. Um, another question, a few years ago, I donated several items to the Newberry after they issued a call for donations to their protest collection. I only found out about the call, though, from someone else. So I'm wondering about how community members know about these opportunities. 
Thank you for that. And thank you for donating. Um, that That is tricky. I mean, we are always trying to put the call out. Um, we just recently put the call out because we're working with WBEZ about collecting restrictive covenants um, that people may have in their homes. Um, we've used WBEZ, we've used social media, we've put material on our website, but sometimes it, it is just word of mouth. It is just somebody saying to somebody, you know, I heard about this or I read about this. You know, often, you know, if I might jump in, you know, archiving is like a really niche thing. So you're not thinking about it. You don't think about it. I, I equate it to, um, like a pottery shop. If you have no idea that you can go down the street to a pottery shop and make your own cups and you happen to discover that, you're like, oh, wow, how come you're not advertising this? Well, it's a niche interest at a very specific point in somebody's life. And um, so you always have to constantly put information out there. So, I mean, what Shorefront does, we put out um, an article about once a year or put on social media from time to time, the question, what's in your attic? You know, we're looking for things and and come to um, a workshop of how to discover what you have in your own in your own archives in your own homes and what you can do with it. But it's a constant education. Great. We have more time here for more questions. If anybody wants to pop anything in the chat, or you can also unmute yourself. Feel free. Um, I really appreciate all of the panelists. Just want to take a moment to thank you all for sharing everything that you've shared today. I know I appreciate it on behalf of the BMRC and I know our community members appreciate it too. Um, somebody asked, are all the org social media handles, the orgs here on your website? Great, it looks like everybody's are. Um, wonderful. Oh, great. And Allison just dropped the link to the OCLC report. Fantastic. I am going to share a couple links as well before everybody heads out. The first is just a link again to the resource packet, which I did update access to. So now you can access it. Um, and I'm going to quickly update that link to the feedback form, um, which we would really appreciate if you could please take just a couple minutes to fill it out. It really helps me plan future events, know when to have them, how to have them, um, how long to have them for, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, any more questions from anybody before we head out here? Thank you again to the panelists. We appreciate your space and time sharing about your repositories with us. It's exciting to hear about the work that you're all doing um, and excited to have folks in the audience get connected to the BMRC further. Awesome. Fill out that feedback, feedback form when you get a chance um, and I hope everybody has a good rest of your evening. Thank you.